also serve as the community as the community manager for the AG Lanning Community of Practice. And before we get started uh, with introducing the speaker, I'd like to invite you all to join the AG Lanning Community of Practice. This community launched in March of this year and is designed to elevate the stories of geoscientists and other STEM professionals working to create a more inclusive scientific culture. It also provides networking opportunities and resources with the goal of building a thriving community for diversity, equity, and inclusion champions in the geosciences. And if you'd like to learn more about the landing program um, and to join our community of practice, please visit agu.org slash agu landing. And I also want to acknowledge on this next slide, our amazing group of ambassadors who have been working with the landing team to develop this resource and with their wealth of expertise, we look forward to creating more resources and opportunities for engagement. And now I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Dr. Margaret Frazier to introduce our speaker for today. Awesome, thank you so much, Brielle. Um, hi everybody, I'm Margaret Frazier. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a co-principal investigator for landing and director of diversity and inclusion here with Brielle, Landing's community manager. And I just wanna give a special shout out to um, the landing postdocs, ambassadors, fellows, and advisory board members who are here. So it is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. J. Marshall Shepard. Dr. Shepard is a leading international expert in weather and climate and is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia. In 2022, Dr. Shepard was named the SEC Professor of the Year. In 2021, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineers, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the first faculty member in the history of the University of Georgia to achieve this trifecta and the first African-American to do so. To his knowledge, he's the only second scientist to achieve all three in one year. Then in 2020, Dr. Shepard also published a book entitled The Race Awakening of 2020, a six step guide for moving forward. He was the 2013 president of the American Meteorological Society, the nation's largest and oldest professional society in the atmospheric and related sciences. He serves as director of UGA's atmospheric sciences program and is full professor in the Department of Geography where he's the associate department head. Dr. Shepard is also the host of the Weather Channel's award-winning Sunday talk show, Weather Geeks, a pioneering Sunday talk show on national television dedicated to science and, a, and is a contributor to Forbes magazine. And then finally, Dr. Shepard routinely appears on national media outlets like CNN, The Weather Channel, CBS Face the Nation, and more. He also provides his expertise to NASA, NOAA, the White House and Congress. We are very lucky to have you here, Dr. Shepard. Thank you so much. And if you could please join me in welcoming, welcoming him. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and try to share my screen as, while we're getting started. I, I should make one clarification. Our Weather Geeks is now a podcast. We don't, we don't do it as a television show anymore because everyone streams and gets their information via podcast, but we did do it as a TV show for many years. Can, can you see my full slides now? Yes. Oh, great. That was easier than I thought. So thank you, Dr. Frazier, for uh, that kind introduction. And I learned in the opening before we came on live that Dr. Frazier is a fellow Georgia Bulldog, uh, spending some time in our uh, Department of Geology. Uh, and we know or uh, have mutual acquaintance with the building because my department shares that building with geology. So it was nice to hear uh, of someone that will understand what go dogs means. But go why dogs. don't we jump right in to this conversation? And I, I change the title of this all the time. So I don't know exactly what the subtitle heading was that I gave to the folks at AGU. Um, but I think it was something along the lines of Dr. Marshall Shepard in 21 Pictures, uh, a, a complex journey with a simple uh, goal in mind or something to that effect. I, I use this as an opportunity to tell several stories and tell it in a way that's not the usual death by PowerPoint. Now I'm using a PowerPoint, but there won't be a lot of words on these PowerPoints. In fact, there will be mostly pictures and that's by design because I really wanna tell you my story and share my story with you in 
what I hope is 21 pictures. Who knows, maybe I took one out or added one, but approximately 21 pictures. And I'll start here because I know with AGU Landing, there's a, an effort to think about diversity, uh, inclusion and equity. And for me, growing up in a small, at that time, rural community, Canton, Georgia, which is about 35 to 40 miles north of Atlanta, uh, in the, I guess, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, I wanted to be a scientist, but there were no scientists that I knew. I grew up in a single parent home with my mom. She was an educator uh, in a fairly modest community. Um, there's certainly no one that would have access to any scientists that I could go and talk to or speak with as a mentor and so forth. So finding inspiration where you can is a big part of my story. And this first picture is Dr. George Washington Carver. I never met Dr. Carver, never, never sort of been in his presence at all. It was well before my time. But my mom, who was an alum of Tuskegee Institute at the time, uh, I used to go to homecomings there. And I learned as a young boy about all the amazing things that Dr. George Washington Carver did with the peanut, with limited resources, by the way. And so I went to my local library there in Canton, Georgia as a young boy and read voraciously about Dr. George Washington Carver. So in a way, he was my first mentor through books. I never again had the opportunity to meet or interact with him at all. And so that was really my first exposure to a scientist and particularly a scientist of color, which is even more rare in my circle, even today, frankly. This brings me to honeybees. And you're like, you gotta be going, where is he going with this? Well, in fourth and fifth grade, I was, again, I grew up as a, an only child in a single parent home. So I used to spend a lot of time entertaining myself. And one of the ways that I did was I would be in the yard catching insects. I used to catch honeybees and uh, grasshoppers and ants and just sit there and watch them. And one day when I was in fifth grade, I had, had plans to do my sixth grade science project as I was moving to the next year on bees, but I was stung by a honeybee in my yard and almost died. I found out I was highly allergic to bee stings, and this was before everyone carried EpiPens around. And so I was rushed to the hospital, and apparently they saved me because I'm here talking to you today. But at that point, I knew I needed a plan B, pun intended. And so I did my sixth grade science project on weather. In fact, the, the title of that science project was Can a Sixth Grader Predict the Weather? And I made all the weather instruments from things we had around the house. I mean, I didn't have all these fancy weather stations and so forth. Uh, I made a barometer out of a, a jar with a balloon stretched over it with a straw sticky, and it actually worked pretty good. And so I demonstrated that with these household homemade weather instruments, I could track the weather pretty accurately for my community. And so won the local science fair. And by that point, I was literally bitten by the weather bug, pun intended again. And so this is just one of the many course corrections in my career story that came about. And so from that point on, even after sixth grade, I knew that I wanted to be a meteorologist. But I also knew that I didn't want to be the meteorologist in front of you on the news saying today's cold front will be sliding south. And I, I wasn't interested in that. I wasn't really interested in forecasting at all, even though even today when I tell someone I'm a meteorologist, I get three questions. I, what channel are you on? What's the weather going to be tomorrow? And my daughter's getting married in September. Is it going to rain out the reception? I don't know. But those are the kinds of questions that we get as meteorologists. I'm actually in the research side of the house. I, I, I've spent most of my career in R&D. But even after sixth grade, I spent my time researching where is the best place that I can go to study meteorology. And for me growing up in the South, and at that time especially, uh, Florida State University appeared. And so what you see here is a picture of the Love Building at Florida State University. That's the building where I spent the majority of my undergraduate and graduate years. I did my bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in physical meteorology there at Florida State. They have a brand new spanking geosciences or Earth, Atmosphere, and Ocean Sciences building now uh, that sits next to this building, which is still there. 
And so I, I can't help but to sort of reflect on the many hours that I spent there uh, honing my chops as a meteorology student and actually getting my first taste of research as well. By the way, I should mention, because this is about diversity, equity, inclusion, when I walked through those doors as a meteorology major, there weren't a lot of people of color in that program. That's still the case decades later in many atmospheric sciences and geosciences and STEM related fields. In fact, I was president of AMS. Uh, I know that in recent numbers, number of African-American or black scientists in AMS membership is about 2%. I don't know what the AGU numbers are in terms of membership, but I bet it's not, not reflective of the 12% of African-American or 13% of Hispanic Latin in this country, because that's what we know is the case for any sort of technical organization. It's not a shot at AG or AMS, just it is what it is. And so for many people, I want to sort of pause here and talk about pipeline issues, because you often hear pipeline, which I hate. Can we just sort of destroy that term? Because it's so used in the lexicon of this diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion. I hate it. I literally hate the term pipeline because pipeline sort of sort of suggests that there's one way in and one way out. And you'll hear people talk about the leaky pipeline. So maybe there's another way out through the leaks. That to me is not reflective as a professor, as a professional of what is happening in terms of diversity and inclusion in our fields. Uh, I think I saw Dawn Wright on uh, earlier on this. Uh, I don't know if she's still on. She's a very awesome colleague of mine at Esri, and she probably can reflect on many of the same stories and things that I'm about to share. I don't think it's a pipeline. I think it's more like a freeway or an expressway. Because one of the things that often happens is when you have a black scientist or a black student like me that goes to a place like that and they see that they're the only student of color or the only woman in the class, some like me are like, okay, whatever, let's do this because I want to be a meteorologist and move on. And I go through that freeway and cruise. I'm cruising in the express lane, in fact. But then there's some people like, yeah, I don't feel culturally accepted here. I don't feel comfortable here. And they take an exit off. And maybe they stop and have a cup of coffee for a few years. And maybe they get back on. Maybe they never get back on. And so this is why I believe, and I see this, it's not just about feeding a pipeline. It's about making sure that people stay on the freeway. Because there are numerous programs at the AGU and the AMS and NSF, even private companies and so forth, that have tried to tackle this pipeline program for decades. And guess what? The numbers really aren't moving the way they need to be. So it's not just getting people in the pipeline, so to speak. We've got to think about retention issues. We got to think about microaggressions and cultural things that are happening in our departments and universities and places of employment that are causing people to exit and never get back on. So that's something that I wanted to sort of exit and not digress for a second And I, as I talked about this picture. Here are four more pictures. And these are my mentors. Mentors are very important. And this is also part of the problem with our expressway or our pipeline analogy. Uh, many students of color don't have an adequate uh, infrastructure of mentors. Mentorship is very important. I wrote about this in Forbes many years ago uh, about the fact that mentorship is a key component. And as you saw, one of my earliest mentors was someone in a book. So Dr. Warren Washington, whom I know many of you know, has shaped much of the philosophy about how I've approached my career over the years. Uh, but Professor Peter Ray was my graduate mentor, uh, not a perfect person in any way, uh, but in terms of scholarship, led me through uh, the academic um, sort of maze that was Florida State at the time. Dr. Joanne Simpson, I mean, imagine a young graduate student walking into the halls of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and, and literally working right down the hall from an icon. And Warren's an icon in our field too, by the way. But literally, I was working right down the hall from Dr. Joanne Simpson. And if you don't know who she is, Google her. First woman to receive a PhD in meteorology. Uh, some of the fundamental knowledge of tropical meteorology today is because of Dr. Joanne Simpson. And then Dr. Franco Inaudi. He was the head of the of Earth Sciences for many years at, uh, at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Peter Ray called Franco and said, I've got this young African-American student that wants to work for NASA one day, he even said it in his valedictory address in high school. 
Uh, do you have any openings? Well, he didn't. There was a hiring freeze in the government at the time, but Franco went and talked to him. He was impressed enough. He said, well, wait a minute, let's go work for one of our contractors. And there will be an opening at some point and we'll try to get you in. And that happened. And I was able to go back to Florida State to get my PhD. And somewhere during that time, I met Dr. Warren Washington, who didn't know me from Adam, as they say, but invited me to spend some time with him out in Boulder, Colorado at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. I spent a week, just this young scientist that Warren had invited out. And I, lo and behold, I learned that, you know, he, he, that's his MO. He's done that with many of us that have moved on in our careers. And in that week, Warren shared so much advice for me that I now pass on to my students or to young, young scholars that I mentor. For example, Early in my career, NASA figured out that I was fairly good at talking about complex geosciences topics. So they'd put me on TV or they'd have me do interviews. And I was doing quite a bit of them and enjoyed it quite a bit and was decent at it too. Warren said, you're gonna get a lot of opportunities to do that because you speak well on the topics and you're young and you're vibrant. You're gonna also be the one because you're black, whenever there's a student, black student that comes to God, or that's who they're gonna ask to talk to. You're gonna, they're gonna ask you to talk to them. So you're going to be overburdened with those kinds of requests and mentorship opportunities. It's a burden that we bear. Don bears it. Others of us bear it. But Warren said, establish your science. Establish who you are as a scientist first, and that will make your mentorship and outreach that much more powerful. And that was something that really resonated. So when I became a fellow of the AMS or received the Presidential Early Career Award at the White House or well, gosh knows how this happened, was elected to three national academies, you know, I knew my science had arrived. And so that makes my mentorship and outreach that much more important because I see many young scholars of color that kind of get pigeonholed or typecast into the mentorship outreach role. And that's fine. We've got to do it. But we need strong, good scientists as well. Which moves me into this picture. This is the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission. This is a satellite. This was one of the first missions that I worked on as a scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Joanne was the project scientist for TRIM, and I was on as a support scientist at that time. I'm going to take a quick uh, tap here and see what's going on in the chat. Okay, those nothing's there for me. I always like to do that in Zoom just to make sure that some, someone's not trying to tell me something. But this mission was, was career shaping for me because it got my feet wet in doing research on satellite-based data sets. I went on to do research on how urban environments affect rainfall or rainfall and hurricanes or other extreme hydrometeorological processes, but it all started with this satellite. So this is just part of my science that I'm fairly well known for. I received the Helmut Landsberg Award for my work in urban meteorology from AMS. I mean, we've done work, for example, over the years that shows that over and downwind of cities, uh, there's a, an anomaly in rainfall, in part because the city, through the urban heat island, through convergence because of the buildings, through aerosols and pollution, modify the precipitation, spatiotemporal precipitation distribution around cities. So this is one aspect of research that I'm fairly well known for these days. Another sort of area of research that I'm known for is rainfall hurricane work. So on the left is a one of our papers published in an AGU journal, Geophysical Research Letters, uh, where we use that data from the TRIM satellite to show that it's the small tropical depressions, tropical storms, maybe even tropical systems that don't get a name that contribute the most to in terms of coastal rainfall in a given year, not the big Cat 3, Cat 4, Cat 5 hurricanes. And we show that those are the types of storms that you need to break drought in the Southeast. And so this is just sort of a reflection of some of that. More recently, some research out of my group and by my former student, Dr. Teresa Anderson, we developed this concept that many of you may have heard of called the brown ocean effect. This idea that hurricanes and tropical cyclones are supposed to weaken when they move over land. But in fact, sometimes they don't weaken. They actually maintain their intensity and move uh, intensify or amplify their intensity. And it's because they move over wet soil or wetland. We saw it last year with Hurricane Ida, I think, when Ida made landfall in New Orleans and sat over the wetlands. Hurricanes aren't intelligent. So they don't know they're not over water when they're sitting over a wet land mass or over a, a mangrove or a, or a swampy region. So they still are getting latent heat flux that can feed them. So that's just another example of, of research that I've done over the years. 
More recently, we've been doing research on sort of climate risk, vulnerability, and so forth. We developed a climate vulnerability index for the state of Georgia showing what counties are most at risk uh, from climate change. And then we expanded that in 2020 to the nation and projected forward what are the most vulnerable counties to climate change by the year 2040. And so these are some of the things in these pictures that sort of illustrate that type of research. And finally, some of my more recent research has looked at something that we've called racialized urban heat islands. So we have looked at city of Atlanta using satellite data sets. And my, again, uh, this is work I'm doing with uh, geographer Steve Holloway and Jerry Shannon. And we've taken MODIS satellite data and we've looked at the heat islands of Atlanta and taken some of Steve Holloway's urban geography racial data from the census. And we find that black people and people of color are living in the hottest parts of the, Atlanta's urban heat island. And that, that's going back to some historical practices related to redlining and other things that we know about. And so we call these racialized urban heat islands. There are these heat islands within the heat islands that are disproportionately exposed, exposing underserved marginalized populations to excess heat. And so on the right in this picture uh, is an effort that we have proposed in con uh, concert with my colleagues at Georgia Tech, Arizona State, and North Carolina A&T. We want to engineer cities for thermal justice. That's a new concept. You may not have heard of it because we made it up. We want to engineer cities for thermal justice. We want to fundamentally change how we engineer cities to redistribute or repurpose this excess heat in different parts of cities. And I'm not just talking about high albedo reflective pavements or planting trees. I mean, that's kind of the low hanging fruit mitigation. We've got some fundamentally innovative strategies that we're proposing. We've submitted these to various agencies within the federal structure. So stay tuned because if they get funded, we'll be able to start our effort to engineer cities for thermal justice. These next two pictures illustrate something that if there is a young scientist listening to me right now, or even an old scientist for that matter, broader engagement. We have to be there in the spaces that scientists are uncomfortable being. I'll say that again. We have to be there in the places that scientists are uncomfortable being. Because if we are not, people with agendas or with misinformation will gladly fill the gaps that we leave behind. And so that's why, you know, I've, I've taken on, you know, when I was asked to run for president of the AMS, you know, I'm only the second African-American that serves president of AMS uh, behind my mentor, Warren Washington. Uh, when the Weather Channel approached me about hosting the first of its kind Sunday talk show for weather and climate and science called Weather Geeks. And there you see a picture of me with uh, former National Weather Service Director Louis Uccellini. I did it because I saw it as an opportunity to broadly engage and share vital information about our field. I, I'm a senior contributor to Forbes. I've done three TED Talks, one of which has over 3 million views now. We have to be in these spaces. You know, there, were, there was a time and many of the, the um, people that are a bit more senior like me in the audience will remember when a scientist wasn't seen as a credible, serious scientist if they did these types of things. Oh, there are popularizers. I never was bothered by that narrative, by, uh, by the way, because I, I'm still the most productive uh, scholar or one of in my department in terms of papers published per year in the peer reviewed literature and grants received in terms of intra extramural funding. So I fundamentally try to shatter that narrative that you cannot be a serious scholar and do these things and tweet. I still have colleagues that say, I don't do that new stuff, Twitter, newsflash. It's not new. It's been around for a while. And we need to be there. I'm there at Dr. Shepard 2013. If you want to follow me and you aren't following me, I, I know that uh, colleagues on, on this, uh, on this uh, webinar are on there. I see, see many of you. We've got to be there. And so it, this is just a part of this paradigm that I call end-to-end -end science. By show of hands, and I can't see the hands, but raise them anyway. By show of hands, when you were in your graduate program in some kind of geosciences field, uh, how many of you uh, learned to talk to the media or write an op-ed or, or do press interviews or testify before Congress? Probably not too many. I see a few hands going up. 
But not too many of us took classes in that. We learned how to write theses and dissertations and present at conferences like the AGU. To me, that's not enough anymore to train graduate students. We have to train graduate students and retrain scientists to be end-to-end -end scientists. We have to know how to do our theses and dissertations and conference presentations and submit papers and so forth and write proposals. But we also need to know how to talk to CNN or testify before Congress. You see this picture here from 2019. And uh, by the way, Billy, we were just talking. I mean, he's off the picture there, but I believe that's Tony Busalaki, or he might be over here in the picture in the, as we were testifying before the House Science Committee uh, in 2019 on extreme weather attribution and climate science. So we've got to have an, a paradigm shift. And I think it's starting to happen because I'm enlightened to see some hands go up, the ones that I can see uh, when I ask that question. And I'm going to end with this picture of my book. I'm a scientist, but that is not who I am first. I am a black man in this country who has two children and a wife. And so when George Floyd happened, I was distraught for days. I, I just couldn't function. Because in that moment, I remembered the time that I was pulled over in Maryland in a rental car when I was working for NASA and questioned as to why I had a rental car in that region, because there'd been a series of auto thefts in that region. I said, sir, I'm a NASA scientist. This is a rental car issued by the agency. Well, you fit the description of car, car thieves in the area. Those memories came back to me. The memories came back to me of four AMS presidents standing in a lobby at an AMS convention. And of all of us standing there in a suit, someone walked up to me and asked if I was the airport shuttle driver. So these types of things are things that maybe resonate with some of us in the audience, but not others, but it's important to share. So I just needed to do something. And so one Sunday morning, I sat down and wrote this book. It's a short book, about 70 pages, because I was having colleagues from all races, all backgrounds saying, Dr. Shepard, I get it. I see things that maybe I weren't, wasn't able to see before through understanding what has happened with George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or others. And so I wanted to do something positive. And so I wrote this book and I lay out six steps that anyone can follow to move the needle forward. Because it's, I don't need to be talking about this. We need a broader conversation amongst us all to move us forward. So that's why I appreciate this webinar series that the AGU has uh, put forth. Um, we, we can't be uncomfortable talking about these challenges. We, you know, we've got to get rid of that narrative. I don't see race. I don't talk about color. I, that's like saying to a tiger, I don't see your stripes. That's, those stripes are fundamentally a part of who that tiger is. So once we can get over this hump of saying what we think is the right thing to say and talk about the issues and keep it real as the young kids say, that's when we can move forward on some of these issues. And so that's what I tried to do in this book. It's available on Amazon uh, as a hard copy print for copy or a, a digital version as well. So I want to stop there and leave some time for the moderator to engage in perhaps some of your questions, because I do have a pretty hard out bumping out up against the 1 p.m. hour. So I, I want to leave enough time for us to engage. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. Um, thank you for sharing your journey with us. Um, you inspire all of us. Um, to everyone who is listening, if you um, would like to raise your hand or put a question in the chat, um, Brielle and I can help moderate that. But um, thank you, Paula. Paula, um, go ahead and you can come off mute and ask your question. Yes, hi, Dr. Shepard. Uh, thank you for doing the work that you do. I've actually had the pleasure of actually being in a lecture that you gave at UGA about the importance of science communication and you wowed the group in and you wowed us again today. So just had to say that. Thank um, you, Paula. My, you're very welcome. Um, my question is about, as a science communicator, um, I actually, I've actually gone, conducted or been a part of SciComm training. And my question is, you know, you are, one who is talking about the importance of climate change and how it affects us and how it's unfortunately racialized and minoritized. How do you then deal on the flip side with someone like Ben Spann and who will say, I talk about the weather, but I he won't talk about climate. How do you effectively deal with that issue? 
Well, first of all, James is a good friend of mine, so I, I, I'm not going to disparage him. But James and I have had this conversation before. I've been on Weather Brains and Weather Geeks. You know, I, I think, you know, James says that, but I think if you follow some of the things James is a narrative on that topic has evolved over the years. You know, I mean, he, he recently tweeted some things out there that are posted on his Facebook about the current heat wave we're experiencing in the South and talking about the context that we've been warmer in the 1930s. I mean, rather than really getting in a debate back and forth with James on that, I actually wrote a Forbes article, which is actually my most recent Forbes article out there. If you go to my landing page on Forbes, talking about how, yes, 1930s in the Dust Bowl was a really warm year. Uh, it was really hot. But no, it doesn't refute the fact that heat waves are becoming more intense and frequent because of climate change. And I use this analogy that uh, of, a, of a basketball player because my son's a basketball player. I mean, imagine, you know, Michael Jordan always had really good jumping ability, so could always dump the ball, dunk the ball. So that's natural climate variability if we use the analogy. Climate change is basically adding a foot to the basketball floor so that it just makes it easier for Michael Jordan to dunk, even though he could always jump. So adding that extra flooring to the floor makes it easier to dunk, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he always was naturally gifted at jumping. And so I, I just, you know, in that situation, you know, you know, James and I, we, we, we meet where we can on certain things. And I, I, and I think, again, I, you know, I talk to James outside of the public sphere, so I know where he's coming from with some of this. But what I am heart, uh, what I'm encouraged about Paula, uh, was it Paula that asked the question? Yes. What I'm encouraged about is that if you look at the numbers being published by people out of George Mason, uh, my good friend Ed Maybach and others, um, the vast majority of TV meteorologists and those in the broadcast side of meteorology have come around. Uh, there was a time where there were many broadcast meteorologists that would not talk about, but the, I think that's really more the exception than a rule now. We've got numbers within the AMS that show that, and there are many different reasons why uh, the, the great work of folks at Climate Central, for example, just the new narratives that come out of the AMS and so forth, and, a, and an understanding that, you know, even in a, perhaps a conservative market like James is in in Alabama, uh, there are people, exemplars like Jim Gandy in South Carolina or John Tui Morales in Florida or Amber Sullins in Arizona, that you can still be in a conservative market and be the leading broadcast meteorologist and talk about climate change. So I think that a lot of the broadcasters are just very weary of that. And sometimes we found in the past, it wasn't just the, the meteorologists, it was their station managers. Uh, they were worried about ratings and stuff too, but there are papers that have come out that show that ratings don't suffer when broadcasters talk about it. So I think, I think we've seen an evolution of it. Thank you. And yeah, I just put in the chat, that's a great point. And then also, you know, with that, with those situations, meet people where they are as opposed to where we think they should be. Right. Yeah, you can't. I mean, I, I, I've i never tried to be one that just slammed a, a, a square peg into the round hole, as they say. I mean, you know, there's a really nice acronym that a guy named Steve McNulty put forth in a, in a meeting that I was in several years ago. He's a climate scientist in North Carolina. It's ELFLAND, E-L-F-L-A-N-D. And I'm probably not gonna get all of them right, but the first E uh, is uh, in ELFLAND was engage. So engage, so if you go to a group of farmers in South Georgia that may be climate skeptics, engage with them, then the, the L is listened. Listen to what they say. Oh, so are you seeing more drought? Are you seeing more frequent drought and how does it affect your peanut? Not really imposing anything on them. Then after you listen, the next F is find common ground. Oh yeah, so you are seeing more drought or intensity of those droughts. Uh, so then once you find common ground, uh, then you can lay the foundation to work together, nurture and develop solutions. So uh, it, it, it's a strategy to the approach. And I, I think somewhere in one of my Forbes articles, if you just type Elfland and Forbes, I think I kind of laid out more specifically what they are. So I have found that that has, uh, has worked. And that's why if you follow me in social media, you will see that there are people that violently disagree with some of the things that I say about climate change, but there's a mutual respect there. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. Um, we have someone else to ask a question. Dianthe, forgive me for mispronouncing your name. Okay, uh, my name is Dianthe Viratna. I'm, uh, I advise um, uh, undergraduate minority Cal State Northridge. First, I wanted to say thank you for some ray of hope on how to address environmental issues 
in neighborhood. Now I will add your solutions to my problem. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing. I mean, it's coming in and out. Uh, I can hear you at times. I don't know if anyone else is having that. How about that? Is that better? Much better. Oh, sorry. So I'm an advisor of, of undergraduate uh, minority people in geology, earth sciences at Cal State Northridge. And at first, I want to thank you for your vision of some solutions for the environmental justice issues that I mentioned. And now I will add your solutions to the, you know, the downer information that I have to share with them. So that's exciting. And then I just wanted to ask about your charge of asking people to walk into these uncomfortable spaces because one of my students, for example, is the only black student in every class she walks into. And mm -hmm. I, I don't always have, I don't know how to tell her to keep walking into these rooms when it's really hard for her. And I don't, yeah, I, I think maybe you, just have to, you, maybe just have you have to pick and choose your rooms you walk into or no, when you're able no, or. No, you just have to do it. And again, I know that's hard to say because I'm everyone's wired differently and we have to understand that everyone's wired to deal with walking into that room uh, and seeing that they're the only one didn't bother me at all. I notice it. I'm aware of it. And I and I, I, I keep that in my mind. I don't I don't underestimate it. But I tell I'll just tell you what I tell my own kids. My I've got a daughter that's headed off to college. She's going to be she's going to go to law school, but she's also thinking about doing some environmental policy undergraduate work as well. I mean, you're going to be one of the few in the room. Uh, tell my son that. I like own it. Understand that there may be narratives in some people's minds about you and understand that there may be narratives that are not about you. But, you know, you just have to sort of have this Teflon of I, I call it your Teflon of your own goals on. It's like this armor, you know what you're trying to achieve and are you going to let uh, sort of innuendo perception and even our own insecurities keep you from your goals? That's my mantra. It may not work for everyone and I know that it won't work for everyone. My wife and I actually talk about this all the time because we're wider very differently. But that, that's honestly the only advice I can give because if it, it, otherwise, if you leave the room, if you get off the expressway, then we're talking about instead of 2% of AMS or AGU, 1% or 0.5. So we can't mm -hmm. leave the room because we're uncomfortable. There are many, many times where we're uncomfortable. We gotta, we can't leave the room. And by the way, I just dropped something in the chat. And I mean, that you prompted it when you said minority and we all say it. And I know it's even embedded. I, in I'm sorry, I didn't want to say the word. <laughs> No, no, it's 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 embedded in all of our institutions. I still say it at times, but I wrote an article about why I believe we need to remove referring to us as minorities in these STEM spaces because, and I, I lay out the case in that article for why. But um, um, and and that that's not something directed at you because I say it too. The AMS still it's, uses it's okay. the AGU has things in there. I mean, there I, I had the AGI Minority Scholarship when I was at Florida State University uh, that Marilyn Souter used to be a part of. For those that know Marilyn, so it's just something that I'm trying to kind of sort of get into the narrative because I just think it's one of those sort of subtle microaggressions that are part of our institutions that we just need to get rid of. Okay. Point well taken. Thank you. Um, Someone Maybe is asking to for me to give the reference to the article, but I don't know what article she's referring to, Luciana. I see it in the chat. I just don't know what she says. She said, can you give the reference to your article? I don't know which one you're referring to. I think you did give the link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah you just so. said that you wrote an article about dropping minority from... Yeah, the, it's from in the chat. Okay, so I that's just the article that in, I was referring to. Yeah, it's there in the chat now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Shepard, if I could um, keep using um, that thread in a way, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, you just, you push through it, you do it. And I was also thinking about what you said earlier about shattering the narrative. And, and this got me thinking about um, self-care and things that Angela Davis has said and Audre Lorde has said, um, you know, so for example, self-care has to be incorporated in all of our efforts and caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. And so I'm wondering, 
what does self-care and self-preservation look like for you? And do you have any um, advice or words that you feel like you can share with us? Yeah, self-care looks just like what I sent when I sent an email saying I have a hard out 10 minutes before this ends because I want to get to my son's basketball game. I never have been that scientist that actually is in my lab or office until 10 a.m. at night. I'm home with dinner with my wife and kids every night and have been for years. I say no a lot these days to things that I'm asked to do. In fact, I just tweeted today, uh, um, you know, about sort of the the oh, the burdens that we all as academics can bear because we're asked to do so much. You have to set boundaries. I'm not burning myself out for NASA, at the University of Georgia, or anyone. The most important things to me are my family, family first. And the things that I like to do, I mean, I'm going to a concert tomorrow. I've been to two concerts in the last week. I went to see Tears for Fears and I went to see Arrested Development because I love music. So again, it's important that self-care is, I never looked at it as self-care. I just looked at it as prioritization. And what's important to me is I don't define myself as Dr. Marshall Shepard, the professor or scientist. I'm Dr. Marshall Shepard, the guy that likes to play tennis and go to concerts and watch basketball and college football, who happens to actually be a weather geek. Love it. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have a question um, they'd like to ask? Let's see. Okay, I have, I do have one question for you. Oh yeah, I've still got time. Sure, sure. Go. Oh, okay, super. So, um, so I was wondering, um, you know, DEI has become um, more prominent in higher education um, in the last five um, to seven years. And as you mentioned in your book, The Race Awakening, it's been catalyzed by the pandemic and increased visibility of brutality against black bodies. And so, um, I'm just wondering very generally, does this feel like a real lasting movement? And um, I don't want you to give away um, everything that is in your book, but do you have a, you know, maybe one actionable item um, that people can take away? Yeah, so several, you know, one one thing I talked about and I mentioned it is that we have to see color. We can't we can't sort of use this mantra that we, of, of so forth that, that we have to be aware of all of our own microaggressions mm -hmm. uh, in the space. Um, we also have to be aware of the majority community because the DE, DEI is a thing now and it still probably makes some people feel uncomfortable. And so you have to navigate that space appropriately because like. You know, there's still people sitting there like, great, DEI. I mean, I'm on your side, but why, I mean, is it just, why is there so much DEI? I mean, it's just, the, is it just the next thing? So you have to be aware of and cognizant of colleagues in that space. And again, meet them where they are, as opposed to just ramming DEI down, down, down the pipe as if that it's your worldview should be their worldview immediately. Um, it, it's, it's, that, that's very important as well. And, you know, there are a few other things that I talk about um, in, in the book as well. In, in terms of understanding about perceptions uh, and, and, and of, of people uh, and, and so forth. And, you know, something else, I, you know, I, I had, I've had the fortune or uh, to give two commencement addresses in the last 10 years, one to my alma mater, Florida State, and one to the University of Georgia's graduate commencement. And in both of those, I talked about using a math reference because I'm a minor in math, uh, a circle and expanding your radius. I mean, we all know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. And so the larger the radius, the larger the area of the circle. And so it's important for us to expand our radius of influence and who we associate with. You know, a lot of times we only interact with people of different gender, color, uh, religious perspectives, uh, um, and so forth at work or uh, in social state. That's, uh, what I mean is by that is like if our kids play soccer together or whatnot. But do we just go and have dinner with or have coffee with and sit down and really try to expand our radius by understanding the perspective and worldview of others? I mean, I, I look around here in Georgia, and I'm sure it's wherever you live as well. I see kids that go to schools that are very homogeneous, not a lot of people that look like them. They all think the same. And I'm talking about on both sides of the ledger here. And so 
I just think that's counterproductive to the, to the society that we actually live in. And so if we have a very narrow circle of influence and we haven't expanded our radius, uh, that leads to very narrow thinking as we move forward in, the adult, in adulthood. It leads to people thinking that uh, vaccines are, are hoaxes and that climate change isn't real and those types of things. So the more we expand our radiuses and move beyond confirmation biases, consuming information from places we already agree with, um, and understanding our own cognitive biases and understand that the Dunning-Kruger effect is real, where there are people out there in social media and in our families and at the Thanksgiving table that think they know more than I do about climate change, but they don't. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's so powerful. The And the importance of human connection and not you can't separate, you know, quote unquote, so, you know, pure science from people. And so thank you for that. And yeah, I just did it. I just recorded a, an episode of my Weather Geeks podcast. And I was talking to Dr. Eric Kleinberg from NYU about the, his new book on, on the uh, heat wave of, of 1995 in Chicago that killed a lot of people. And a lot of them were people of color. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about as much as it, it was a weather a climate disaster. It was also what he calls a social infrastructure disaster in the sense that the people that suffered the most were in environments where there wasn't a lot of social interaction. There wasn't a lot of uh, interaction among people on a daily basis. So when these people weren't sitting out on their stoop, people didn't stop by to check on them and things. So this, this idea of social infrastructure that Eric Kleinenberg talks about is very important as we think about things from a science lens. Thank you for that. You've given us a lot to think about and follow up on and you're getting lots of finger snaps and yes. Yeah. I, I, and, and again, if, you know, definitely if you, I, I'm recognizing some of the names in the chat, definitely follow me on Twitter because I, I discuss a lot of these types of things all the time in that space. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to honor um, your other commitments. And so um, Brielle is going to um, wrap it up for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. We just want to share my screen really quick and just want to invite you all, um, as I mentioned earlier, to stay connected with AGU Landing. Um, we will be continuing to uh, this series of the AGU Landing Inclusive Science Series of highlighting um, various stories of those doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the geosciences. Um, and other STEM uh, fields as well. So just please stay connected with us by visiting hu.org slash hu dash landing and join our community of practice. And just wanna thank you all again for joining. Thanks everybody.